I would quite often try and have conversations with people about how, you know, isn't it interesting how human evolution relates to such and such a disorder behavior, you know, thing that we're seeing. And they'd be like, what? What are you talking about? I said, because <laughs> how do you see this? this? This makes it all make sense. I'm Adam Hunt, and this is the Evolving Psychiatry Podcast, rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens. Share it with the people who matter, like it if you like it, subscribe if you want to hear more. Tom Carpenter is a trainee psychiatrist in the west of Scotland. Um, he's also deeply involved with the Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, he's done a great job in uh, mustering up a lot of interest from trainees around the UK. And there's a group of, is it about 20 trainees now, Tom, who you've got on there? Yeah, more, more. More? Same. Okay. Yeah. So Tom is really the guy who's... Um, kind of pushing uh, young psychiatrists in the UK to think about evolutionary psychiatry, and he's done a great job there. Um, we're involved in some work together. We're running some studies looking at uh, the effects of evolutionary explanations on psychiatrists. Um, Tom has a, has an interesting history, so um, so I thought he'd be a great addition to the to the pod. Thanks for coming on, Tom. No, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, so, so can you talk a little bit about your history with evolutionary thinking and your trajectory through academia and also psychiatry. Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose evolutionary thinking is maybe what came first. I remember, uh, I think it was probably about 16, and I was in the school library, uh, and I was just really drawn to this giant golden book. Yeah, probably because it was just a big gold book. And it was, it was, um, it was uh, Edward O. Wilson on human nature. No, it was a, a text of its time, right? But I just really, uh, I think I re really enjoyed the explanations for why people are the way they are. You know, I, I remember he had, he had this metaphor of uh, of thinking about development in terms of uh, boulders rolling down a hill, and there being sort of grooves that sort of in the, in the, in the hill of different depths, and the boulder could take diff different tracks depending on what kind of grooves it went in. And that really kind of I don't know resonated with me. And, I've always been interested in why people are doing what they're doing, you know, um, but never really been satisfied with the explanations. So that kind of gave me a sense that there are deeper explanations out there for why people do what they do. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, uh, then I didn't go into medicine straight away. I did an undergraduate degree in human sciences, which is this wonderful kind of broad-based um, degree looking at uh, you know, anthropology, sociology, tomography, genetics, human ecology, you know, cool. a, a different thing every month it felt like. Um, and then um, I, and then after that, what did I do? I, I worked in marketing for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> That's and, psychological uh, somehow. Let's you know, I know yeah, exactly. Actually, I remember the, the um, it, it's, it, I guess, it, I guess it's all about sort of about manipulating people's behavior, isn't it? So maybe it's <laughs> which is what uh, psychiatrists psychiatrists are trying to do that to some extent, but in a different. Well, I mean, <laughs> they, they use the word manipulating, um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, altering, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So maybe it's a similar similar vein, isn't it? Uh, and then. Um, uh, I I ended up going. I, I thought, no, I don't do this. Um, I did a master's degree at Newcastle University in animal behaviour. After that, uh, that was with um, uh, Daniel Nettle, um, who I, I read some of his stuff when I was an undergraduate. I thought this is really great, um, and I was really excited to then do this 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 degree with him, sort of leading it. And I remember uh, one moment when maybe half a dozen of us in the room and he drew on the board this big kind of you know table it's like across the board and it was it was tin bergen's four questions right oh. and i thought this this is it this is this is how we understand how and why things happen this is brilliant um uh then i kind of thought i was going to be a behavioral scientist maybe uh but i had applied to medical school um probably because probably because my mum kept on you know, nagging me about it, and um, so, so <laughs> I, I was like, "You could be a wonderful doctor." Like, All right, I'll apply. Um, <laughs> uh, so I did it. Keep the parents happy, uh, and and I've been rejected roundly from everywhere. But then actually, 
I got, I got a phone call the week before term was going to start uh, from, from Edinburgh saying, actually, I've got a place. Would you like to come and do the medical school thing? So um, so I did that rather than try and go and do a PhD or, or, or whatever. Um, so then obviously it took quite a long time. Um, uh, and, and then all through medical school, I remember I was kind of carrying this torch for evolution because I was, deep, I was quite dissatisfied with all the explanations we were being given for everything. <laughs> Um, right, interesting. Uh, How's that? How did people react to that? Were people a bit like, uh, yeah, I suppose the evolution matters, but yeah, whatever at I all? Mean, yeah, people, whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and then I like, guess that, that sort of leads on to why, um, how, how kind of become involved with the, the, the EPSIG, because um, so I was doing psychiatry training and I would quite often try and have conversations with people about how, oh, you know, isn't it interesting how human evolution relates to such and such a disorder behavior, you know, thing that we're seeing. And they'd be like, what, what are you talking about? I said, can't you, <laughs> can't you see this, this, this makes it all make sense. Um, but and then, but then I realized I, I didn't have the tools to, with which to talk to people about evolution and behavior and psychiatry and everything, but everything I tried to say kind of fell flat or felt a bit inadequate. And then it wasn't really very satisfactory. Um, so I thought, well, what, what I need and what, then I thought what there will be out there, other trainee psychiatrists who have, have an interest in evolution, but don't have the tools to, to talk about it with their colleagues. This is an important thing. We should be talking about it. So, um, I got in touch with the, with, with Riyad Abed, um, uh, female that of the blue saying, can I join this committee, please? I'm very interested. And, um. Uh, and uh so and, and they let me in which is nice uh since you're a great they, addition yeah a great well uh, your words not mine um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no but you are you're the the group is a lot of um there's a lot of people who kind of started working sort of maybe even like the 80s and 90s there's like this this generation above oh. us right and there's mm. there's not many in our generation who have kind of mm. tried to push for it but you were you were the first trainee i think who um who really kind of found the group and were like, yes, this is what, I mean, it sounds like it was kind of deep in you, right? You, you, you do really yeah. care. And I think people sense that. So that's, yeah. Yeah. That's um, so I thought, so then, and then, and then the, the committee was very keen that we try and engage more with, 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 with trainees. Cause I think they recognized they were sort of an older generation and, you know, where, where, where's the future sort of going to come from in terms of evolutionary psychiatry. Uh, amongst clinicians and so then I thought well let's let's try and find interested trainees throughout the UK and give them the tools that they need to talk about evolution um, so then this kind of led uh, to to uh, establishing this, this this trainee network which is you know a, a small but active group of people from you know throughout the UK um, and Ireland and, and and you know a couple of sort of people are also at from, from from the continent as well um we've kind of been taking it from there we've you know, we, we've had a, a a one day workshop we're organizing another one for next year i'm just trying to build a bit of interest and momentum really amongst trainees trying to spread the word in people's local areas about evolution and psychiatry and and the kind of benefits the perspective of the brain Awesome. And so you've, you've perfectly led on to, um, but what, what are those benefits, Tom? <laughs> What's, yeah, I mean, in this, this, mm. this time going from like a history in human biology and learning a lot about evolution, uh, and then coming into psychiatry, uh, what is, yeah. Do you have like specific examples of like the ideas or the disorders that you find kind of most important? What are the, what are the things that really hit home for you? Where, where are the wow moments, you know, where, is you know and this this is actually what i find quite difficult is 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 sort of exp like find is, is finding the, the the short form ways to explain what i think is interesting right it, it sort of feels more general okay um in that you know personally i feel you probably you can't really you can't feel you've understand you've understood something properly unless you're able to trace it back or like logically from the point of inception to the point at which you, at which at which you see it now, you know. And let's say someone's presenting to you with with, with a particular cluster of symptoms, 
And you, you you can take a very top down view with that, right? You can say this is what they are demonstrating, so therefore this is what they have. But you don't really have a construct of what they actually do have. The sense I'm trying to get to is that it gives you a different framework from which to understand your patients and, sort of, and, 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 and where they're coming from. Um, so, in terms of you know, it it kind of it relates to, I guess. With an understanding of evolutionary psychiatry, you could you you had then ha have a sense of the 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 underlying rules that happen in nature, and then this gives you maybe more of a different kind of pattern recognition ability, right? It, it's a way of making sense of things that doesn't rely on the top down definition, um, like like the diagnostic criteria. And I think, you know, I think it gives you a different way in with the, with with cases so as a as a trainee you know um you still you've, you've got you don't have that hours now as a clinical experience but you're still in a room with a person where you have to, uh, where they're telling you something and you have to try and make sense of it and go up with a plan right um uh to try and help um i think it, it, it kind of helps you get to the to the meat of the matter faster you know it helps you feel which question is the next best question to ask you know maybe you would have got there anyway um but we're but you know but how much more experience would it have taken me to actually know that i think this question is probably the next best question i should ask in the situation um mm. so about like life events or about yeah, like what... exactly so people are describing their their lives um and i suppose let's say let's say you know someone is presenting to you uh with uh, right and you know if you look at that kind of so what, what what evolutionary psychiatry can help you to do is to know about how a trait is constructed right so you take take uh the capacity to feel anxious right so anxiety is a res is is a response to an uncertain threat in the environment and uh the the understanding from evolution psychiatry is that that that's that that, that trait is going to be sort of you're going to have two main features and one is the 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 like well maybe three features one is the the the, the likelihood of a threat and then another one is the extremity of the threat maybe you combine those two into a kind of score couldn't you have like a you know, mm. uh, of, of, uh, likelihood of, of, of harm befalling you, and then your other the other the other side of that coin is um, how able are you to meet the threat in your environment, right? Mm. So, if people are telling you things about I'm, you know, I'm worried about this and that and the other, then you know, then you you, you can explore the 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 two sides of, of 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 what the trait is probably doing. You can have so okay so as an evolutionary psychiatrist you take you have this anxiety diagnosis which maybe some psychiatrists mm -hmm. who think from like a, a kind of neurological standpoint kind of just don't don't see the holistic picture of the person sort of trying to respond to something in their environment in the same way and that it's like this kind of this natural response that's probably causing them a lot of harm or kind of going um going over um, okay, right. So it's a bit more um, like more humane. You like you're you're seeing the individual as they really are, rather than the label. Or yeah, I think so. I think um, the word humane is quite important, right? Um, because psychiatry is kind of interesting because it 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 kind of defines the boundary between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Right, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of it's 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 edgy. It's different from psychology or something like that. In that, you know, psychiatry has got it's 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 got it's got powers and responsibilities that you don't find in in, in other places, at least not very often. Uh, you know, psychiatry has got well, one we can prescribe. You can prescribe medications, right? Which, 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 which is a powerful way of sort of reaching into somebody's evolved systems and changing them and changing the way that they that they operate. You know, um, so you've got access to these kind of powerful medications, but equally, you've got the power to compel people to do things. Um, 
which you know is 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 it's not a power that that many you know I guess you have you know in terms of the criminal courts have that power, don't they? And social work has that power to an extent in in in, in the UK, but but psychiatry, if if it, it's important that psychiatry has a humane perspective because so if, let's say that I'm you know detaining somebody under, under the Mental Health Act, I'm saying that they they are ill and that their behaviour is not acceptable, right? And sure, we have certain ways of judging whether the behaviour is it's acceptable. It's not whether I like it or not, right? It's 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 it's, it's whether that it, it's it's driven by mental disorder and there is there is lack of insight and there is risk associated with, with, with that behavior. We have two ways of defining what's unacceptable, don't we? We we can say that people are ill or we can say that they're bad. Um, and I think there's problems with both of those ways of thinking. But it's not always helpful um, if people identify as ill, then that's probably just empowering, isn't it? Um, uh, and if people are give are, are sort of identified as being bad, then well, you know, I I think that has that that has problems not only for the person who's who's then labelled as bad, but also for the people who are dealing with them, who are dealing with someone who who they who they think is bad, right? Um, evolution, if when you think about evolution. And how this has shaped what our traits and behaviours are likely to be in different circumstances, based on a whole host of good reasons. Um, it it kind of lifts you out of this perspective a little bit. Mm. So uh, it's a third in, way. It's a... This is it, it's it's a third way. I think it's a more humane way of dealing with 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 people who are organisms who are really doing what they do for very good, powerful reasons. Um, this, this is not to you know, say that people don't have individual responsibility for their actions and, and, and things like that, but there's good reasons people behave the way they do. Um, and I think it helps as a clinician, let's say, you know, that, that there's, there, that there's kind of a, there's a lot of stigma, right? It's, it isn't there, that there's stigma in the medical community against psychiatry. Um, I think probably because we're kind of this, 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 again, we're this liminal profession, aren't we, that exists on the boundary of what's like good, of, of, of what's good or bad, or what's um, ill and not ill. You know, meaning, I guess, is, so is, is made either in terms of illness or morality, isn't it? Um, and when you're thinking about evolution, you, you, you can see the person more as, more as, as a human, right, rather than something that, that that is ill or is bad. And let's say, so what I was going to say was in, in, in psychiatry, so you have some diagnoses to stigmatize more than others, right? Let's see, you, you know, um, you've you've got you've got somebody who's got a personality disorder, and there is an awful lot of people saying they're not ill, they shouldn't be here, uh, they you know they're or or saying that you know are oh, this. This this presentation, it's all behavioural. It's all behavioural. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> right. What does that mean? <laughs> it's all, they, of course, it's behavioural. Everything is behavioural. All behaviour is behavioural. <laughs> uh, what, what what they mean is they're at it. They're deliberately manipulating to try and get something. You know, this it's 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 yeah. not real. They're not really sick. I just don't think that's very helpful. Um, yeah. Not only does not not only for the patient, but also for the people dealing with with, with the patient. It's extremely frustrating. To think that you're dealing with somebody who is who's at it, right, and and is trying to manipulate you for different sort of reasons. Now, All right. there's uh, evolutionary psychiatry is one way, I guess, to gain a deeper understanding of why people are behaving the way they do in certain situations. You know, um, because you know you, you can stitch together a few ideas, can't you? Let's say if, if people are expecting a very harsh, hostile in, in, in environment, then it, 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 it can make sense to, to behave in this sort of more wow. uh, pushy, unpredictable sort of way. Um, this is but, very relevant. This is yeah. very relevant, sorry, to um, the episode yeah. with uh, Kristen Syme where she talks about all of her research is into kind of self-harm behavior and a lot of it yeah. might be diagnosed as sort of BPD. Um, mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. She's really looking cross-culturally and showing that these behaviours are, are 
you know, super common. Um, they, mm -hmm. they occur under quite uh, predictable conditions, which is often adolescent parent conflict. And uh, and there's a sense of, and she, she the, the hypothesis is, is called, it's kind of called the, the bargaining hypothesis, but she uh -huh. doesn't mean it as like conscious bargaining. Yeah. She means that, uh, that, you know, there are these emotions which arise in these particular situations, which are basically, you know, raw kind of anger and upset yeah. and, you know, and like this kind of destructive, like self-destructive um, feeling, which is not in, in control, really. You know, we have all these feelings which we experience, which are not like our conscious control and we act out in that way. Um, and that's, and okay, and to some extent, yeah, we're understanding that behavior as a a strategy in an evolutionary sense like there is a there's a reason that you know anger really overtakes you and you you you, you kind of um mm -hmm. you you act in all these ways um but it doesn't but yeah i think there is this kind of interesting middle way of understanding it as a natural response um and yeah to some extent the person is uh like has has some control in the in the way that you um you kind of mentioned but then there's also this this fact that they really are you know they, they have these emotions and that's what's that's what's happening and that's why they're behaving this way and they mm -hmm. shouldn't really be blamed for it but they're also not they're not completely hopeless at the it, at the that, whims of the illness that's it so that, that's kind of the continuum between ill and bad isn't it yeah uh, where if, if if you're ill maybe you don't have any any agency in this whatsoever um that's maybe yeah. not and if, and if you're bad, well, you've got complete agency in it. But really, it's, 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 humans are these, these sort of wonderful creatures that are the products of a huge evolutionary history. And and it may, and maybe it helps you, it, maybe the middle view, the middle way that people are, you know, they, they have agency, but they have very powerful forces within them that are influencing their behavior is a kinder way to look at people mm. yeah absolutely yeah interesting and you've um articulated that very well I, yeah that's a really nice way to put it um so so we are we are the we are the next generation of um evolutionary psychiatry um we're trying to push the field to the place where we think it should be we're trying to kind of take um the baton from the the generation above us who've who've, who've written some really great books and articles and stuff but we, we really want to um, you know move to the next stage so so yeah what do you think is most um what do you think is most exciting uh let's let's be optimistic here maybe uh what have we what have we got what have you got planned um how are we how are we going to do it where, where do you see evolutionary psychiatry taking its um its place in the in the consciousness of the the people with a psychiatrist or public or whatever yeah i think it's um it, it's it, it's big in that it's, it's not just about psychiatrists and patients it's about you know it it, it, it it kind of goes back to what i was saying about psychiatry being having these kind of certain sort of societal responsibilities um and powers in that they that there's a lot of meaning making that can be done by psychiatry right in terms of saying who's ill and who's bad right um people are always looking for ways in which to add, give themselves meaning and identity. And a lot of the time, people are, are using medical terms, aren't they, to give themselves identity. I have such and such a disorder. I am this, I am that. Um, and they're, they're kind of couched in this kind of, you know, ICD, DSM terminology. But really, I think my gut feeling is that this is sort of disempowering for people in, 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 in a way. If, if, if psychiatry can include the evolutionary perspective in its view about why people behave the way they do, then, then that could actually change how people identify themselves mm -hmm. in across society um, because of this kind of unique position that psychiatry occupies. Now, I don't know, maybe does, does psychiatry just echo? Does it just echo what, what, what the rest of the society is, is defining as good or bad or, 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 or sick or well? Or actually, do, do we have a role in actually making those definitions? Um, mm. Perhaps 
this is all too grand. I don't know. But, but <laughs> there, there is a risk that psychiatry just becomes, uh, it's happened before, right, becomes a tool by which society can say that this, this is okay and this is not okay because a psychiatrist says so, right? right. But if, this, if, if, if we as a discipline have a nuanced understanding about the deep reasons why people behave the way they do, and maybe the risk of that happening reduces. Maybe actually we can we we can nudge nudge society towards a more humane view of you know of of of, of a human experience. Right. Good and bad. Yeah. As, as a whole, I think that's what brings a lot of us um, to evolutionary psychology and psychiatry. Right. There's this. There's this sense that you understand your own fears and anxieties and insecurities a little bit better. Like, why do I care so much that everyone that, that everyone like likes me? And, and why am I um, why, why am I so obsessed with whatever a romantic partner who is like completely um, you know aloof or whatever? But they, they kind of they taking they take up all of my mental space. And it's really interesting to to see yourself in this way. I think. Yeah. And, I, and yeah, I agree. It's this sort of this. It is quite nebulous. Um, it's quite hard. When I've tried to explain this kind of big picture of like the human identity to people, mm -hmm. I think like a lot of the time people don't get it. Maybe the, maybe the, maybe the listeners are also not getting getting it, but but maybe some of them are. Um, but it, it does seem to be this 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 kind of overarching paradigm that like imbues every every uh, insight you have into mm -hmm. the mind in the same way that the the paradigm of whatever behaviorism. Um, sort of sees everyone as a product of their experience, and and uh, yeah, and then, but I think it's I think it's better to to take the the evolutionary approach. I think it it does a lot of a better job to understand these these nuances of the human experience, which are um, maybe sort of mysterious from a behavioural uh -huh. uh, point of view. You didn't you didn't learn to fall in love and kind of obsess over someone and think about them for eight hours a day. Um, you know that's just that's just deep in you. Um, you know you didn't learn to be socially anxious about and, and kind of concerned about how your friends think of you when you're a teenager that's just that's just part of it's part of being a teenager because you're an adolescent and you need to you need to kind of find yourself in a group and have some social support um yeah i think it's a really i think i think it's a nice sort of comforting thing um to sort of understand your mind whether or not you actually gain better control over it because of that mm -hmm. i don't i don't know um possibly possibly <laughs> but, yeah. I think there's certainly some work to be done, right, around around this. Um, you know what what effects can having it, it, thinking in evolutionary way. What can it do? Well, we 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 hope something good can come of it, and that it's not just a yeah. uh, pure theoretical um, speculation and nice yeah. ideas. But uh, but yeah, well, that's that's something that we're going to be working on, Tom, isn't it? So, yeah. Oh yeah, go on, sorry. And this is all very grand stuff. But I suppose also we shouldn't think it, we shouldn't neglect kind of a slightly more uh, lower level, right stuff. Because this, 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 this ground idea, they're all well and good. Um, but c c can it do other things as well? Maybe it can help you change how you make research predictions, research questions. You know, yeah. you, can it even suggest uh, like practical things that you can do? Probably, it probably can. Because because if you think about how, if if we understand the evolutionary history of a particular trait, then we can we, we we can see what parts what aspects of that trait that we are we are sort of working with and 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 one of the ones that we're not so we talked a bit about anxiety earlier didn't we we talked about how uh, you know you you have you have this idea that there's that there's uncertain threat on one hand and then there's also your ability to meet an uncertain threat on the other hand well these these sort of evolutionary systems are kind of you know this and I, I actually, I don't know. Maybe someone is looking at this. I don't know. But the, here, here is one research hypothesis for free. Let's say um, that your, your 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 anxiety system is is is, is ancient, predating humans. And let's say humans have a lot of social anxiety, whatever. Let's say you've got social anxiety or anxiety about not not about an immediate physical threat happening to you, but your anxiety system is probably based on. A large amount of evolutionary time where the threats were largely physical. You, you, so the, we've, we've got one side of the coin, which is kind of reducing people's worries, um, reducing people's perception of 
out extrinsic risk. But what about the other side of the coin where we, are there any interventions we can do to increase people's sense of, um, uh, sort of, you know, physical, physical resilience. So the, the research question would be, uh, you've got somebody who is suffering with an anxiety disorder and you just give them something and you give them physiotherapy, right? To, 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 to increase whatever signals to, 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 to increase the signal of a well body or a body that is resilient to threat in general. And if you can, if you can change the signal for, you know, threat in general, mm -hmm. uh, you being more resilient to that, will it actually reduce your anxiety as a whole? You know, wow. is, is anyone looking at I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, there's obviously a load of research on yeah. exercise and mental health. Um, sure. It's a kind of, that's a fun hypothesis as to why exercise is yeah. actually has this positive effect. It actually just makes you more capable in general yeah. and you're somehow your body and brain are kind of recognizing, like, I yeah. can deal with stuff. Totally. Uh, and then once, and then if you, if you can identify that system, can you find the most efficient way to, 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 yeah. to think it? You know. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm so sure there, there's loads of these hypotheses that could, yeah. And there'll be loads of these, exactly, loads of these hypotheses that, that, that are right. Right. Because we have to narrow down the, like the possible space of treatments, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you can, mm -hmm. you can think of any set of words to tell someone there's like infinite words you can say to someone in a mm -hmm. therapy session. There's essentially infinite life interventions you can do, you know, you can, you can make people engage in particular types of hobbies of any kind or go and socialize with all sorts of people in different sizes of groups and in you know different contexts at different times of day uh like there's a, there's a, you know we have so much possibility but like maybe the evolutionary um explanations hone this down and they say okay no what you really need is a group of about 20 people who you're sort of you meet yeah. with um regularly and who you kind of somewhat interdependent with um yes yeah, those sorts of things or yeah, more specific and more efficient about about what is it we're actually looking at you know you could you could say this is your top three and they should look a bit like this right and it's kind of a priori theory driven um mm -hmm. whereas you know currently the theory that we have is sort of well it's either behaviorist and a bit more like well you can just learn to think in a different way and uh yeah maybe you can <laughs> but maybe maybe not or or it's um you know biological and then it's it's then it's just very different and you don't have any of these nice predictions about life events that you can use to alter your biology in a, in a yeah. sort of appropriate way. Yeah, so maybe yeah, we, we can design better interventions. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's obviously the <clears throat> that's the goal uh, eventually. Um, you know, understanding is not enough. This is, a, you know, there are people who, who we can hopefully help. Um, cool. Well, this, is, this has been great, Tom. Thank you yeah. for... Uh, uh of sharing your thoughts and at the at the vanguard of the field who knows if we'll actually follow up on any of these i look forward to the the decades ahead where we're sort of trying to make some of this stuff happen and and see where it goes yeah. um and it's been great kind of working with you and i appreciate you coming on the pod so thanks for inviting me yeah cool uh see you around all right cheers take care <laughs>